Hello guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Peyton Hawes. This is my husband Colin joining me for today's video. We are, I kind of have a sore throat so ignore if my voice like goes in and out or if I just like start hacking to the side. Anyway, today we're going to be recording an episode for our CES letter series on the channel where we're going through the CES letter. If you're new here and you don't know what that is, it is a basically like a book at this point that someone wrote from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or the Mormon Church. Uh, he Well, you might describe it a little bit better. His name is Jeremy. Yeah, Jeremy Reynolds. So uh, we have talked about this in previous videos, but essentially he, he was losing his faith. His grandpa had a contact with somebody who worked for the church educational system, CES. So his his grandpa's friend was the director of CES and basically it offered to like answer questions that he was having as he was losing his faith and starting to question a lot of things in church history and just uh, doctrine in general. So he typed up this letter that became what is known as the CES letter. You can get it for free, cesletter.org. They have a PDF or you can just read it on the web and um, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, and so it gets a lot of backlash from the Mormon church and a lot of people think that it's something that's full of lies and stuff that's trying to pull people away from the church. But in reality, it's just a guy who had his own personal questions and opinions about things that he wanted answers or information on. And basically any of his questions or concerns that are not getting valid or reasonable answers or explanations, it stays in the PDF version where if anybody does have something to say where it's like, okay, yeah, that actually explains it really well. That makes sense. They have removed it from the PDF version of the CES letter, but that hasn't happened too much, huh? I think it's like 5% of the original letter has been like either edited or taken out. There have been like apologetics websites that have responded to a lot of the issues that like Fair LDS, I'm forgetting some of them, but there's like the, is it farms or something? There's like another, there's like two main branches of like the apologetics that you'll normally see that have done responses. But then Jeremy Runnels went in and did responses to their responses to like why their explanations didn't make sense to him or how they were just sort of like non answers to the question. So. He does, like there, there is stuff that he has taken out because he's gotten answers that are like, oh yeah, that's inaccurate or like, you know, that, that does make sense. So, but the idea is that like he was honestly searching for answers. So if somebody gets him an answer that makes sense or, you know, was like, hey, this, this isn't accurate. Like this didn't even happen this way. He'll go in and take it out as long as the information's correct. So, yeah, and I think he has people that are like now helping like manage the actual website and stuff, but. Yeah, and so we've done previous videos on all of, or on a bunch of these so far. We've done, let me like get to the thing to refresh my memory. So we've done the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon Translation, the First Vision, and the Book of Abraham, which that one was crazy. The Book of Abraham one was, that was, yeah. That one was kind of hard for me, even after like deconstructing, it was crazy. Um, but so today we'll be going over polygamy and polyandry, and that's the section that we'll be going over in this video. So we'll just start reading some of it and <clears throat> pause here and there as we have comments or things we want to say about it. Yeah, and something that he does to sort of preface each section is he'll put a quote from somebody from the church kind of like to highlight the issue. Mm -hmm. So I remember in like the Book of Mormon sections, it's like, you know, how the church hinges on the Book of Mormon. There's quotes about it being the keystone of our religion. Everything rises and falls with the, the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. So this one is the polygamy and polyandry section. And there's a quote here from Marlon K. Jensen, who was an LDS church historian. And the quote is, so the question of polyandry, polygamy is when a man has multiple wives. Polyandry is when a man marries another man's wife. Joseph did both. So it's basically a, a church historian confirming that this was practice, which is interesting. I actually saw a video on YouTube 
yesterday, it was like a, like a live debate that was happening and it was two members of the church. I think one was excommunicated because he doesn't hold like the same views, but they're both like, I guess, Mormon, so to speak, and that they believe, believe about, they believe in Joseph Smith as a prophet and everything, but they were debating whether or not Joseph practiced polygamy. So the one side was arguing that like a lot of the stuff that we have about Joseph Smith's polygamy was essentially Brigham Young and his uh, like apostles and counselors framing polygamy onto Joseph. Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I, I did like listen to some of it and just was interesting. Like, it seems like there's a little bit of a growing movement of people being like, no, like Brigham Young started the whole polygamy thing, which I think there's been like ideas about that for a while, but it seems like it's actually like getting some traction stuff. Um, Joseph talks about it himself. It's in the Joseph Smith history in the back of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, so that, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of sources that are hard to explain away. For, well, sorry, for, for sorry, that. not the back of the Book of Mormon. It's in like so. Sometimes I forget to like preface. There's the Book of Mormon, but they there's also a separate book that is kind of always in the church, just seemingly been like smushed together with the Book of Mormon. But it has the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine, Doctrine and Covenants. Covenants. Yeah. And in there, there's a Joseph Smith history section, which is just like his writings and experiences and, and stuff like that, which I used to like love reading that part. That was so, I think it made the most sense to me out of all the stories I'd read in the yeah. Mormon. It was, I was just easier to follow. It's not, I mean, the, I mean, the, the church has put out an essay on polygamy and it's essentially verified a lot of the claims in here. Yeah. Um, it does, it does sort of a faithful framing of it. Like mm -hmm. how can you navigate these issues through like a faithful lens, but it's not like the church is somehow denying that any of this happened. It's, it's much more of like a fringe group that's like mm -hmm. wants to view Joseph through this certain lens. And so they're pinning things on Brigham Young. Yeah. Um, there's a, a podcast I was listening to recently that my dad sent me where they were discussing how hard the revelation must have been for Joseph to where he, he says he claims to have received revelation from God, the father that he needed to take on multiple wives. And the, in the podcast, they're talking about how difficult that must have been on Joseph because it went against what he wanted or what he felt was right and how he had to like sit here and battle with these like like how am I supposed to tell people that I received this how am I supposed to practice this it doesn't feel right yeah and I just don't know I think somebody could easily just have the desire to want to practice polygamy which mind you I do not care like I think mm -hmm. there's plenty of different relationship dynamics and ways that people can go about that and as long as it's like consenting adults who are interested or want to do this I don't know this could be like a fetish yeah. or whatever I don't I don't actually mind that when it's consenting adults but when it's like you have to because of religion or fear-based or if there's a something that's kind of forcing people to even if they're saying they're doing it on their own free will but it's because of god anything like that yeah. is like not okay in my opinion but yeah i mean we'll, we'll get into it here but there's some like kind of like what you're talking you're touching on is there's some like coercive elements to the way that this played out and the timeline is messy on how it played out and so i'm sure we'll cover some of that in this section we can kind of maybe trade off like page by page or something yeah because there's, there's quite a few in here so i'll start right here one of the things that truly disturbed me in my research was discovering the real origins of polygamy and how joseph smith really practiced it joseph smith was married to at least 34 women as now verified in the church's 2014 polygamy essays polyandry of those 34 women, 11 of them were married women of other living men, among them being Apostle Orson Hyde, who was sent on his mission to dedicate Palestine when Joseph secretly married his wife, Marinda Hyde, 
Church historian Elder Marlon K. Jensen and unofficial apologists like Fair Mormon do not dispute the polyandry. I already have one thing I want to say about that. So the explanations that I've heard from the other side, because I always want to talk about what other people are saying, because I will kind of also have responses to that. Other people have talked about how it's because these women were married to these men civilly on earth where they were not sealed in heaven. So Joseph like married them in, and were sealed to them. And that's a term used in the Mormon church to um, basically mean you performed certain rituals and acts and did these um, handshakes. I don't know if they were introduced at this time or not, but that basically um, mean that you are married for time and all eternity. So also in heaven forever and ever with God and your whole family and all that. You have to be sealed in a Mormon temple to do that. And so some women uh, supposedly were worried that they wouldn't get into heaven if they weren't sealed to somebody and their their men that they're civilly married to are not there. And so Joseph would marry them so that they they were sealed in heaven with them. And to me, that's not like a great explanation because that still sounds like a manipulative tactic yeah. in my brain. But yeah. yeah, I just wanted to throw that out. There's things other people have said about that and what I say in response. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely gets a little bit messy, but we'll, we'll, we'll carry on here. So he, he puts an update. The church admits to the polyandry in its October 2014 plural marriage in Kirtland and Nauvoo essay. Um, this next paragraph, I think, is is kind of like the real claim with that Jeremy's making here as to like why even this isn't a great explanation. So yeah. the church and apologists now attempt to justify these polyandrous marriages by theorizing that they probably didn't include sexual relations and thus were eternal or dynastic ceilings only. And then he goes on to like ask the question, how is not having sex with a living man's wife on earth only to take her away from him in the eternities to be one of your, talking about Joseph, 40 wives, any better or any less immoral? Yeah, so another explanation for people who don't know. In the Mormon church, the polygamy is technically still practiced not on earth, but in heaven. It, that's how it's taught. Men can be sealed to an unlimited amount of women in heaven. And so it's one man and they can have all these wives and all these like heaven babies and all this stuff. But women can only be sealed to one man. So if a woman say I'm married to you and you're not a member of the church and we just have a civil marriage and all this stuff, and, but you go off and you're say, I don't know, in the military, you're gone and I'm learning all this stuff, and Joseph convinces me to be sealed to him because, like, if something happens, like, I want to make it to heaven, and he, like, convinces me of that. Like, I am now Joseph's wife in heaven for eternity, and I don't get to have you for eternity. Yeah. Because I can't have two men. A women can only have one man, and men can have unlimited women in heaven. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the easiest way to think about this is essentially the, the LDS version of marriage legitimizes the marriage in heaven. So, like, my parents were even married civilly before they were sealed. We we got sealed, like, I'm trying to you remember were, what year. You remember, but, huh? Yeah, I was like six years old or something, around six years old, and we all got sealed in the Salt Lake Temple. So at that point, through the doctrine, like, just doctrinally speaking, my parents' marriage wasn't, like, official for mm -hmm. heaven's sake um, until that sealing. To have to wait at least a year if you were civilly married to go through the temple. And it's kind of like a punishment in a way. I don't yeah. know if it's still that way or not. I, yeah, I, I'd have to look up if that's changed. I, I heard something recently, some video, I don't even remember where I was watching it or who it was, but I heard people talking about the year thing and I kind of like, stepped away from the video assuming that the year thing isn't yeah I, in place anymore but i don't know yeah I, I i wonder if it's maybe one of those things that's like a case by case like you talk to your bishop kind of thing but yeah 
Okay, there's a this last um, a quote here, I guess, about the, the, the polyandry here. So, um, during the summer of 1841, Joseph Smith tested Helen Mar Kimball's father, Apostle Heber C. Kimball, by asking Heber to give his wife... Violet? Uh, Violet. It's just, just spelled differently. Yeah, it's spelled interestingly. Um, Helen's mother to Joseph. And then the quote goes... Shortly after Heber's return from England, he was introduced to the doctrine of plural marriage directly through a startling test, a sacrifice that shook his very being and challenged his faith to the ultimate. He had already sacrificed homes, possessions, friends, relatives, all worldly rewards, peace and tranquility for the restoration. Nothing was left to place on the altar save his life, his children and his wife. Then came the Abrahamic test. Joseph demanded for himself what to Heber was the unthinkable, his violet. Totally crushed spiritually and emotionally, Heber touched neither food nor water for three days and three nights and continually sought confirmation and comfort from God. On the evening of the third day, some kind of assurance came and Heber took violet to the upper room of Joseph's store on Water Street. The prophet wept at this act of faith, devotion, and obedience, Joseph had never intended to take Violet. It was all a test. I literally felt like I was going to cry listening to that. I'm really moved by, like, emotion. So if there's descriptive language on what someone was experiencing emotionally that was hard, it, like, tugs on my heartstrings a little. And it just, like, gives you a, a little piece perspective of, like, what that must feel like for yeah. people. Yeah. Like, could you imagine if, if somebody like my records are still in the church, uh, but I no longer have a ceiling to you because you removed your records. Could you imagine if like I started believing in the church again and there was someone who was convincing me that I needed to be sealed and that I became sealed to someone else through like manipulation and you didn't have yeah. any more because of that? Like. That's like yeah, when you really wild. think about it in that perspective <laughs> of like how hurtful that must be. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy. It's it's wild. And he kind of goes into that. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to take over or you sure. want me to keep reading, but it's this uh, paragraph right here. Okay. If Joseph's polygamous slash polyandrous marriages are... So, if Joseph's polygamous slash polyandrous marriages are innocuous, dynastic ceilings meant for the afterlife as the church and apologists are now theorizing and joseph wanted to dynastically link himself to the kimball family why was apostle heber c kimball so troubled by joseph's command for his wife that he touched neither food nor water for three days and three nights out of the 34 women seven of them were teenage girls as young as 14 years old Joseph was 37 years old when he married a 14-year-old Helen Mar Kimball, 23 years his junior. Even by 19th century standards, this was shocking. And then there's an update here. An up update, we mean kind of like how there have been edits that were made in the PDF version just to kind of like... You know, Some of this stuff came out after the first version of yeah. the letter, essentially. So this is an update to this. The church now admits that Joseph Smith married Helen Mar Kimball several months before her 15th birthday. In its October 2014 Plural Marriage in Kirkland and Nauvoo essay, and if you actually go to the PDF link that I will have in the description box below, there are direct links and resources on this PDF version that you can click on and it will take you to church approved sources where they're admitting yeah, it's, this information. They're super easy to use. They're embedded in the text. So yeah. you just see the, the line and you can click on it. Yeah. Joseph took 14-year-old Helen Mark Kimball's hand in marriage after his disturbing Abrahamic test on her father. Heber, while promising Helen and her family eternal salvation and exaltation if she accepted. And here's the quote. Just previous to my father's starting upon his last mission, but one, to the eastern states, he taught me the principle of celestial marriage and having a great desire to be connected with the prophet Joseph. He offered me to him. This I afterwards learned from the prophet's own mouth. My father had but one ewe lamb, but willingly laid her upon the altar. 
How cruel this seemed to the mother, whose heartstrings were already stretched until they were ready to snap asunder. For he had taken Sarah Noon to wife, and she sought, she thought she had made a sufficient sacrifice, but the Lord required more. I will pass over the temptations which I had during the 24 hours after my father introduced me to the principal and asked me if I would be sealed to Joseph, who came next morning and with my parents, I heard him teach and explain the principle of celestial marriage, after which he said to me, if you will take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. None but God and angels could see my mother's bleeding heart when Joseph asked her if she was willing. She replied, if Helen is willing, I have nothing more to say. She had witnessed the sufferings of others who were older and who were better understood the step they were taking, and to see her child, who had scarcely seen her 15th summer, following in the same thorny path in her mind, she saw the misery, which was as sure to come as the sun was to rise and set, but it was all hidden from me. And so this came from Helen Markimble Whitney's 1881 autobiography so this this is direct quotes from her so back to jeremy reynolds talking about this he says why all the ag agony and anguish if this was an innocuous dynastic linking and sealing for the afterlife why did it seem cruel to violet whose heartstrings were already stretched among the women and girls was a mother-daughter set and three sister sets. Several of these girls included Joseph's own foster daughters who lived and worked in the Smith's home. And it shows it's the Lawrence sisters, the Partridge sisters, and Lucy Walker, and you can go find links to those. If some of these marriages were non-sexual, dynastic, eternal sealings only, as theorized by the church and apologists, why would Joseph need to be sealed to a mother and daughter set? The mother would be sealed to the daughter and would become part of Joseph's afterlife family through the sealing to her mother. Further, Joseph died without being sealed to his children or his parents. If a primary motive of these sealings was to be connected in the afterlife as claimed by the church and apologists, what does it say about Joseph's priorities and motives to be sealed to a non-related and already married woman, Patty Sessions, and her 23-year-old already married daughter, Sylvia Sessions, than it was to be sealed to his own parents and his own children? Joseph was married slash sealed to at least 22 other women and girls before finally being sealed to his first legal wife, Emma. Emma was not aware of most of these other girls slash women and their marriages to her husband. Why was elect lady Emma, the 23rd wife to be sealed to Joseph? Some of these marriages to these women included promises by Joseph of eternal life to the girls and their families or threats that he, Joseph, was going to be slain by an angel with a drawn sword if the girls didn't marry him. And that's directly in the Doctrine and Covenants in, in Scripture by the church. Um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of like one of the things after reading this section of the letter, I went back and read. So DNC 132, I'm pretty sure, is the section. I don't know which is after it, but it's the section about polygamy. If you go back and like read it under this framing of like it sort of being a tool to convince Emma and like whatnot, you can kind of see like there's some like manipulative tone and stuff in the mm -hmm. scriptures. And, and so like, it's really hard to see that as an active member. I mean, I never read DNC 132 and thought of it as like, oh, this is Joseph convincing Emma. It was more like, this is like eternal marriage being introduced to the church kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but you can definitely like pull those tones out of it and realize like what's happening there. Yeah, I remember as a kid thinking about how violent some of the stories were in the scriptures. And it was really concerning to me. And my parents would kind of explain it as it was a different time and things were 
different and you know we've just evolved and developed over time where we've learned about like not killing people Mm -hmm. and just more stuff like that but it's just like why is it saying that god it's all teaching that is coming from god though yeah yeah and it's it's really hard to kind of like unless you unless you've lost your faith in this being god's word or this being some revelation like it's really hard to see it any other way yeah Um, it's something someone said to me recently that kind of had me like thinking about a a possibility of there being a god again where i was just kind of i guess toying around with the idea was that like the existence of a god doesn't have to be based off of like anything that anyone ever taught you about who or what god is yeah any of the like any of this stuff that you were taught in any religion by any family member church organization whatever if you're not vibing with all of these things and you're like okay well if god's doing all of these things like i don't like that or i don't believe that there would be a god if he's doing all these things and he was just talking like the existence of a god doesn't have to be based on any of the beliefs or teachings that were told to you about who or what he is. And it was kind of just an interesting perspective, I guess. Yeah. One thing I wanted to add just from the section you just read was um, something that like really did like stand out when I read this was when he's talking about Heber C. Kimball's reaction to like test with his wife. And he says, like, again, if these were like dynastic ceilings, if this was just people trying to link themselves to the prophet for the afterlife, like that would be mostly symbolic and the people would know that. It seems weird that it would make him not eat or drink water for three days. Like Mm -hmm. clearly he understood what marriage meant. Clearly he knew. And so that was the test for him. So like, the, the apologetics arguments like, oh, he wasn't sleeping with these women. These weren't, these were just the early saints linking themselves to the prophet for the afterlife. Like you could make that argument, but it makes it really weird to kind of like read the, the framing there. Why were people struggling with this concept so hard? Why was it such an Abrahamic faith test? Mm-hmm. Um, if it was just this innocent dynastic ceiling. Yeah. All right. So I will um, carry on here. So. Jeremy Reynolds goes on to say, I have a problem with this. This is Warren Jeff's territory. This is not the Joseph Smith I grew up learning about in church and having a testimony of. This is not the Joseph Smith to whom I sang praise to the man or taught others about for two years in the mission field. Many members do not realize that there is a set of very specific and bizarre rules outlined in Doctrine and Covenants 132. Um, and then in it says, still in LDS canon, despite President Hinckley publicly stating that polygamy is not doctrinal. There's a link here for where President Hinckley said that. I think that might have been like one of his TV interviews, but on how polygamy is to be practiced, it is the kind of revelation you would expect from the likes of Warren Jeffs to his FLDS followers. So FLDS is a branch off of the church. Warren Jeffs is their prophet. You could literally Google Warren Jeffs and you'll see that he's in prison for doing horrible things and marrying little girls. And basically it's interesting when you learn about the religion and see how it actually makes more sense, the FLDS church, when it comes to like what Joseph Smith said he was like restoring to the earth and what he was claiming God wanted for them. That's what the FLDS church is doing. And it's got... It got Warren Jeffs in prison and Joseph Smith was also jailed, which has made a lot of the members even more faithful because they think that their prophet is just like Joseph Smith and is being like yeah, um, punished in similar ways as Joseph Smith in a way where it's kind of like prideful about it. It's, it's kind of gross. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Yeah, the FLDS is the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. Yeah. I'm pretty sure the F stands for fundamentalist. Yeah. Um, so the only form of polygamy permitted in D&C 132, again, that's Doctrine and Covenants 132, is a union with a virgin after first giving the opportunity to be to the first wife to consent to the marriage. 
If the first wife doesn't consent, the husband is exempt and may still take the additional wife. But the first wife must at least have the opportunity to consent. In case the first wife doesn't consent, she will be destroyed. Um, That's the actual word used, destroyed. Also, the new wife must be a virgin before the marriage and completely monogamous after the marriage or she will be destroyed. And he gives it DNC 132, 41 and 63. It's interesting that the only prerequisite that is mentioned for the man is that he must desire another wife. And in quotes, it says, if any man espouse a virgin and desire to espouse another. It does not say that a man must get a specific revelation from the living prophet, although many members today assume that is how polygamy was practiced. DNC 132 is unequivocal on the point that polygamy is permitted only to multiply and replenish the earth and to bear the souls of men. This would be consistent with the Book of Mormon prohibition on polygamy, except in the case where God commands it to, quote, raise up seed. Yeah, so uh, that is also another contradictory thing where people say that Joseph wasn't sleeping with any of these people or having sexual relations with them when it says in the scripture that the purpose of doing it is to have more children, to multiply and replenish. But then there's also like no record of Joseph having any children, which is, wait, but... What about his children that they talked about just previously? Like he wasn't sealed to his parents or his own children. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so it's it's talking about like um, his foster children. Well, I guess he may, he did seal some get sealed to some of his. Well, he children. I mean he eventually got sealed to he eventually got sealed to Emma. So his kids with Emma, which are the only like proven biological children we have from Joseph Smith, are the okay. ones he had with Emma. Okay. Um, so he eventually did get sealed to her. So they are. I guess, born into that covenant. They are part of. Okay. Anyways, so now it's going to go on, and he, he says, again, contrary to DNC 132, the following summarizes how polygamy was actually practiced by Joseph Smith. And then we're going to just go through a few bullet points here. Joseph married 11 women who were already married. Multiple husbands equals polyandry. So again, if you're supposed to, one of the prerequisites is her being a virgin, Marrying women who are already married, that's doesn't that's not gonna make any sense. Unions without the knowledge or consent of the husband in cases of polyandry. These married women continued to live as husband and wife with their first husband after marrying Joseph. Again, one of the things that was outlined was the relationship has to continue to be monogamous between the man and the woman. So like how are they still living as spouses to their yeah. Husbands they were already married to. And then a union with Apostle Orson Hyde's wife while he was on a mission. Union with a newlywed and pregnant woman, Zena Huntington. And so if you're pregnant, you're not a virgin. Yeah. Unless Thre- you were artificially inseminated, <laughs> yeah. and I don't know that that was a thing that happened. Yeah. I don't know. Threats that Joseph would be slain by an angel with a drawn sword if they did not enter into the union. Zena Huntington, Almero Woodard, uh, Johnson and Mary Leitner unions without the knowledge or consent of first wife Emma including to teenagers who worked with Emma in the Smith home such as the Partridge sisters and the Lawrence girls again big part of it is even if the first wife doesn't consent the guy can do it anyways which yeah. convenient but, but it did say that they need the um the like DNC is saying that it, you have to you have to present it to the first wife. Yeah. Promises of salvation and exaltation for the girls and or their entire families. It's like a... It's so gross. It's, it says like a big sales pitch. Like if you want to go to heaven, you got to do this. And this will guarantee heaven for you. And then like the other like flip side, opposite end of the spectrum is if you don't do this, an angel's going to kill me with a flaming sword. Yeah. And <laughs> In 132, it says that an angel's going to destroy Emma with a flaming sword if she doesn't allow Joseph to do it. Yeah. Um, to practice the polygamy and polyandry and stuff. And wow. so Emma is like, her life was also threatened. Yeah, it's... By it's Joseph, crazy. not an angel. Yeah. Even though... Joseph claiming an angel. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There's a big difference there. Okay, so then it goes on to say, Joseph's polygamy also included 
dishonesty in public sermons and it references yeah. yeah 1835 dnc 1014 um, denials by joseph smith that he was practicing polygamy joseph's destruction of the nauvoo expositor that exposed his polygamy and which destruction of that printing press initiated the chain of events that led to his death yeah. So, do you want to kind of explain really quickly? Yeah, happened? so that, I mean, there was somebody who was, I guess, a, a disgruntled member of the church that knew about polygamy that started this newspaper in Nauvoo called the Nauvoo Expositor, and it specifically was, I guess, exposing Joseph Smith's polygamy and like the dishonesty behind all of it. And Joseph Smith had a bunch of his minions go yes, and <laughs> go and destroy this printing press. Didn't they set it on fire or something like that? Yeah, and so, that, I mean, there's a lot of issues with it, but the main thing is that, like, that's attack on freedom of speech. There, there's a lot of problems with it that led to him being arrested, put in jail. Mm -hmm. I know, and I was always taught that he was arrested and put in jail and, like, sought after because he claimed to see Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ as two separate beings. That's how I was yeah. taught as to why he was... Yeah, I don't know if I was taught that exact, like, specific thing, but similar idea. Like, yeah. he it's was so teaching something teaching. different than, like, Christianity had believed up until that point. And so, like, the Christians were getting upset with him. So mm -hmm. I was always taught that, like, that was the issue. But there were actual, like... Crimes. Criminal acts being done that yeah. led to him being arrested. And I heard he started denying the polygamy because it became illegal right they weren't supposed to be yeah i mean they it what they, 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 they the claim a lot of times is like well it was a different time in the 19th century for like, but no one else was doing it and everyone was yeah. like that's not i mean they, there may have been other groups doing it but th this was not a common practice this wasn't like polygamy was a-okay like mm -hmm. and again i think it's different from like if somebody a couple or something wants to participate in something like that for like their own personal reasons but if it's like if you're coerced into it for religion or there's fear tactics behind it or whatever that's when it's not okay in my opinion I don't know. yeah i will say too like joseph being murdered in prison is bad like i don't think yeah. you should murder somebody like yeah. that that is bad that they did that but it is important to frame why he was there Truthfully, like yeah. it, it's it's good to tell like both sides of the story and be like, yeah, he shouldn't be murdered. Yeah, in jail. I mean, he's in jail serving time. Like, yeah, 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 agreed. So, anyways, was gonna say an illegal marriage to Fanny Alger, which was described by Oliver Cowdery, who was one of the scribes of the Book of Mormon, as a dirty, nasty, filthy affair, and that was published in Rough Stone Rolling, which written by Richard Bushman, who was an LDS historian and author. Did you read that one? I did read that one. That's a long book. Um, that It's good. It like gives you kind of like sort of the scholarly consensus on the history of Joseph Smith. It's good, but it is, it is very lengthy. William McClellan reported a conversation he had with Emma Smith in 1847, which account is accepted by both LDS and non-LDS historians describing how Emma discovered her husband's affair with Fanny Alger. Oh, is this a quote from her? Uh-huh. One night she, well, it's, it's William talking about the account he had, okay. the interview he had with Emma. Uh -huh. One night she, talking about Emma, missed Joseph and Fanny Alger. She went to the barn and saw him and Fanny in the barn together alone. She looked through a crack and saw the transaction. She told me this story too was verily true. Oh yeah, I think it's like, there's kind of a debate about that story because it's kind of insinuated that Fanny and Joseph were like having sex in the barn, but they don't say that directly. So there's a lot of people like apologists yeah. and stuff who are like, no. Yeah, like, it's all speculative kind yeah, of to them. So. But it's it definitely seems that way. Yeah, there, there's definitely a good amount of evidence there for it. Okay, so the LDS polygamy apologists further discuss Emma's disturbing discovery and aftermath here. Joseph was practicing polygamy before the sealing authority was given. LDS historian Richard Bushman states, there is evidence that Joseph Smith was a polygamist by 1835. Again, that's from Rough Stone Rolling. Plural marriages are rooted in the notion of sealing for both time and eternity. The sealing power was not restored until April 3rd, 1836, when Elijah appeared to Joseph in the Kirkland Temple. 
and conferred the sealing keys upon him. So Joseph's marriage, in quotes, to Fanny Alger in 1833 was illegal under both the laws of the land and under the any theory of divine authority. It was adultery, basically what I was saying. Okay. Um, Which, isn't that one of the commandments? To yeah, not commit not adultery. Commit adultery, yeah. So, and again, I... I a lot of this becomes messy because of the way the timeline plays out. It's even if you even if you're saying that, you know, God is giving this information to Joseph, the timelines don't even work out to allow you to do that. I've I also have family members who have explained to me, you know, they like to give Joseph like they like to just talk about how he's human and he makes these mistakes and stuff and I'm just like there's a certain point where there's someone who's claiming to be the mouthpiece of God, the only person on earth who can speak for God, and committing all of these criminal acts yeah. and marrying little girls and doing all this stuff. And it's like, at a certain point, it's like, why would you believe a man like this is the mouthpiece of God? Why do you just believe him? Yeah. Why do people just believe it when they weren't there? Yeah. Because I, I do get it. Like, he is a human being, even if he's speaking for God. Like, you could give him that sort of, like, he's human kind of, like, leash of, like, I understand. But at a certain point, if you were regularly receiving revelation from God and you were having serious confrontations with angels who had drawn swords and stuff, it seems like you would stop being so sloppy with some of the stuff that you're doing. So that's, again, that's just probably is going to sound somewhat cynical coming from somebody who's no longer a member, but it just seems to me from the outside, like at a certain point after seeing angels on multiple occasions, seeing Jesus, like you would stop being so sloppy with the way you reveal things, the way you do things. You would be very, very careful about how you're proceeding with restoring Christ church. Yeah. And it just like, it's almost like the information alone about the first vision and how he saw Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and this whole like faith promoting story. I I guess I can even understand people wanting to, you know, believe that if you feel moved by that kind of thing. But when you learn about the kind of human being that he was and how he lived his life, it's like, why would you want to trust a person like that? All right, DNC 132.63 very clearly states that the only purpose of polygamy is to multiply and replenish the earth and to bear the souls of men. Why did Joseph marry women who were already married? These women were obviously not virgins, which violated DNC 132.61. Zena Huntington had been married for seven and a half months and was about six months pregnant with her first husband's baby at the time she married Joseph. Clearly, she didn't need any more help to, quote, bear the souls of men. How about the consent of the first wife, which received so much attention in DNC 132? Emma was unaware of most of Joseph's plural marriages, at least until after the fact, which violated DNC 132. The secrecy of these marriages and the private and public denials by Joseph Smith are not congruent with honest behavior. Emma was not informed of most of these marriages until after the fact. The saints did not know about what was going on behind the scenes as polygamy did not become common knowledge until 1852 when Brigham Young revealed it in Utah. Um, so again, DNC 132 wasn't made public to the saints until 1852 when Brigham Young put it out there. Oh. So that's another like reason why that, that debate I was about last night is like people try and claim like, this, again, this is Brigham Young framing Joseph Smith. Mm. So, but anyways, uh, Joseph Smith did everything he could to keep the practice secret from the church and the public. In fact, Joseph's desire to keep this part of his life secret is what ultimately contributed to his death when he ordered the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor, which dared, public, dared publicly expose his private behavior in June of 1844. This event initiated a chain of events that ultimately led to his death at Carthage Jail. So yeah, a lot of that stuff is stuff we've already talked about. It was very secret. Timeline was messy. Yeah. Yeah. Consider the following denial made by Joseph Smith to Latter-day Saints in Nauvoo in May of 1844, a mere few weeks before his death. What a thing it is for a man to be accused of committing adultery 
and having seven wives when I can only find one. I am the same man and as innocent as I was 14 years ago, and I can prove them all perjurers. Uh, Who said that? So that's a quote from Joseph Smith. Okay. And it's in the reference given as history of the church. It is a matter of historical fact that Joseph had secretly taken over 30 plural wives by May of 1844 when he made the above denial and that he was ever a polygamist. If you go to familysearch.org, an LDS-owned genealogy website, you can clearly see that Joseph Smith had many wives. Um, the, ch the church's October 2014 plural, ma plural marriage in Kirtland and Nauvoo essay acknowledges that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. The facts speak for themselves from 100% LDS sources that Joseph Smith was dishonest. The following 1835 edition of Doctrine and Covenants Revelations bans polygamy. 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, section 101-4. Inasmuch as this Church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband, except in the case of death when either is at liberty to marry again. So the, it's specifically saying 1835 is the 1835 version of the Doctrine and Covenants. Mm -hmm. There's another one. Thou shalt love thy wife with all thy heart and shalt cleave unto her and none else. And then section 65 from the same version. Wherefore, it is lawful that he should have one wife and they twain shall be one flesh. And all this that the earth might answer the end of its creation. Do you want to take over for a little bit? Sure. Keep reading. Let me see, like, how much... We're getting there. This is, I think it just okay. ends with those charts. Okay, cool. Joseph Smith was already a polygamist when these revelations were introduced into the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants, and Joseph publicly taught that the doctrine of the church was monogamy. Nevertheless, Joseph continued secretly marrying multiple women and girls as these revelations slash scriptures remained in force. In an attempt to influence and abate public rumors of his secret polygamy, Joseph asked 31 witnesses to sign an affidavit published in the LDS October 1, 1842 Times and Seasons, stating that Joseph did not practice polygamy. Pointing to the above-mentioned DNC 101-4 scripture, these witnesses claimed the following. We know of no other rule or system of marriage than the one published from the Book of Doctrine and Covenants. The problem with this affidavit is that it was signed by several people who were secret polygamists or who knew that Joseph was a polygamist at the time they signed the affidavit. In fact, Eliza R. Snow, one of the signers of this affidavit, was Joseph Smith's plural, plural wife. Joseph and Eliza had been married three months earlier on June 29, 1842. Two apostles and future prophets, John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff, Woodruff, were also aware of Joseph's polygamy behind the scenes when they signed the affidavit. Another signer, Bishop Whitney, had personally married his daughter, Sarah Ann Whitney, to Joseph as a plural wife to a few months earlier on July 27, 1842. Whitney's wife and Sarah's mother, Elizabeth, also a signer, witnessed the ceremony. What does it say about Joseph Smith and his character to include his plural wife and associates who knew about his secret polygamy and polyandry to lie and perjure in a sworn public affidavit that Joseph was not a polygamist? Now, does the fact that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy and polyandry while denying and lying to Emma, the saints, and the world over the course of 10 plus years of his life to prove that he was a false prophet, that the church is false? No, it doesn't. What does it prove, however, is that Joseph Smith's pattern of behavior or modus operandi, operandi? Yeah, his mode of operation, how he operated and behaved. Okay. For a period of, of at least 10 years of his adult life was to keep secrets, to be deceptive, and to be dishonest, both privately and publicly. It's when you take the snapshot of Joseph Smith's, of Joseph's character, and start looking into the Book of Abraham and Kinderhook Plates, the Book of Mormon, the multiple first vision accounts, priesthood restoration, and so on, that you begin to see a very disturbing pattern and picture. Today, Warren Jeffs is more closely aligned to Joseph Smith's Mormonism than the modern LDS churches. 
That's what I was talking about earlier. How the FLDS church is actually following what Joseph Smith said was the restoration of yeah. the, the church and gospel. Where the mainstream LDS church, which is what we were a part of. Me, technically, I still mm-hmm. am, but I'm not an active believing member. And so yes, there's yes, yes. comparative charts. Yeah, there's some charts here. Joseph Smith versus Warren Jeffs. And I'll um, have that on the screen. And again, just a reminder, Warren Jeffs is the prophet of the FLDS church, the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints, and just shows like their family tree. This one is Joseph Smith's polygamy and polyandry. So it shows all of his It's a messy wives. chart, but... It kind of shows the mother-daughter pairs, the sister pairs, and just it gives you the whole picture of all these different wives and relationships. Yeah, and that's the end of that, um, that section. polygamy section. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the Jeremy Runnels, I think, summarizes a lot of it really well in his own commentary as to, like, you know, as you learn about these things and how they unfolded, it's not, it, it rocks you because like you, again, you sing praise to the man about Joseph Smith. Like you're, this is somebody that you, you don't worship Joseph Smith, but you very much so like have this like very high level of respect that like God chose him to restore the gospel. Then you discover this pattern of like deceit and lying and just the, I guess the immoral nature of some of these acts, you know, Mm -hmm. coercing teenagers into marriages and getting their family to like, believe that like this was their way into heaven. And so there's just, I think polygamy becomes a very disturbing discovery that makes it easy to like lead you out of faith in Joseph Smith. Because you can, you can use the claim that Joseph Smith was a human being and he does these things and there's, you know, probably people on earth today who are doing very, I mean, there are in the FLDS church, there's people doing these things still today. And it's, it's sad, but yeah, human nature, there's obviously multiple horrible things that people can do. And you can just say he was human, but it's like, why choose him to trust that he was honest about why pick and choose like what he was telling the truth about and what he wasn't because he did a lot of shitty stuff. And it's like, I don't, that was a big factor for me in like my shelf breaking, which is a term used a lot for people who left the church, just like things that didn't make sense or you didn't understand. You like put it on a shelf for later. Like, and at one point your shelf becomes so heavy that it breaks and it falls and you leave the church. And that was a really big thing for me is I lost faith and trust in Joseph Smith and who he was on earth because I was like, a man who's doing these kinds of things, say he was human, whatever. There's people who have done plenty of worse things. I'm, I still, I don't believe him anymore. I don't have any trust in what he says because he has these patterns, like you said, of manipulative behavior and lying and deceit and all of this stuff. It's like, yeah. I don't trust you anymore. So I'm not going to trust that you so had this vision to. and, and yeah. translated this stuff. Like, I just don't believe you anymore. Yeah. And that was very big for me. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, that's the end of this video, guys. Hopefully you liked it. If you made it all the way to the end, put a... What what emoji? If you made it all the way to the end, put a... A, a yellow heart <laughs> emoji. <laughs> okay. It, no, just put, see that in the put a heart in the comments mm. if you made it all the way to the end. Any color you mm. want. But don't forget to subscribe if you're not already. And give this video a thumbs up and that watch actually, some of our other videos. And Yeah, that's actually a great idea because that helps us kind of understand, like, how long should we be making these videos. If you're enjoying it and you're watching all the way through and you put a comment with, like, an emoji of some kind and we can know that that's what you're saying, it helps us kind of gauge, like, should we shorten these, should we make them yeah. longer kind of thing. Yeah, so. for sure. And I, a lot of people are kind of labeling this as being more of a podcast now than a YouTube channel. Oh, well, it's like a YouTube channel, but being more of a podcast, which 
wasn't necessarily my intention from the beginning, but it seems to be getting there and I'm perfectly fine with that. And we're going to get mics and mm -hmm. we're going to get multiple camera setups yeah, and we'll better stuff once I start making money on here. We got the studio um, set up a little better. Just got to get my watch hours mm -hmm. and start making some moolah and then I'll reinvest that money into the channel and just keep making better content for you guys. So, sweet. Love you guys. Bye.